This is the Comedy of the Week for BBC Radio 4. If you'd like to find out more about any of our comedy shows, please visit bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. But first, here's this week's comedy. I've heard a number of people over the years called Beatle number five. It's generally a claim made on their behalf, often when they're not alive. All the fifth Beatles I've heard so far could populate a symphony orchestra. Just how many fifth Beatles can there be? Well, I'm sorry, folks, I couldn't resist. I counted them all and I made up a list. There are 37 Beatles and the 37 Beatles is me. Yes, it's me. Yes, it's me. Right, well, about this time last year, I was desperately trying to think of a show to take up to the Edinburgh Fringe, all right? And I was getting nowhere, and then suddenly I had a massive stroke of luck. Tony Sheridan died. Um, <laughs> yeah, bit cold-blooded, but it really helped me out. Um, if, if the name Tony Sheridan is ringing any kind of bell, um, he was another Scouse rock and roll musician living in Hamburg at the beginning of the 60s, the same time the Beatles were there. And he actually put a record out while they were all out there. He uh, released a single. It was a, a cover of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Still comes on the radio occasionally. The Beatles were the session guys on that track. And it was the first record the Beatles were ever on. So, obviously, when Tony Sheridan died about a year ago, a lot of the obituaries began with sometimes referred to as the fifth Beatle. Tony said, oh, how many fifth Beatles have you heard? That there are, I've heard a lot of people called the fifth Beatle. They can't all be fifth. Mathematics alone dictates this. <laughs> if there is a fifth Beatle, then the others have to surely be the sixth, seventh, eighth, and so on. And I thought, well, by that rationale, I'm probably like the 29th Beatle or something. But anyway, I did them up, and it turns out I'm 37th. So there you go. <laughs> uh, but uh, b- b- before we go any further, we all know who the Beatles were, yeah? There's a few blank looks. Um, <laughs> It's by no means a given in this day and age. Well, if there's anybody who's a bit in the dark about what I'm on about, I offer this by way of an explanation. There was a band once called the Beatles In the 1960s, long ago They were a bit like One Direction Except they played instruments And they wrote their songs and had amazing ideas and weren't just vacuous gonks with immaculate teeth and ridiculous hair and were immeasurably better on every conceivable level. So that's who the Beatles were. (laughs) And this is what we're going to do. We're going to count people down in descending order of Beatledom, okay? So, we will start at the top with number one, John, number two, Paul, number three, George. I realise that's the order everybody says that, and it also happens to be correct. Um, (laughs) Chronologically speaking, anyway, John started the Quarrymen at school, skiffle band. Basically, one bloke and a guitar and four or five mates bashing household objects behind him. So, (laughs) literally, anybody could give skiffle a go. So, John Lennon gives it a go, puts the Quarrymen together, and famously, they're playing the Walton Fair in July 1957 when a a mutual friend, Ivan Vaughan, drags Paul McCartney along. Paul immediately impresses John by playing John's guitar upside down better than John can play it the right way up. So, (laughs) Paul's. And George, meanwhile, is this softly spoken little 14-year-old nerd who's figured out that the best way to get into one of these new rock and roll groups, despite having no discernible personality, is to work out all the little fiddly guitar bits on the rock and roll records rather than just mashing away at the chords like everybody else does. So he gets brought in on lead guitar, and uh, John is dimly aware of George, having been a couple of years ahead of him at primary school, which does lead me nicely to the first of today's... Mitch Ben's tenuous Beatles connections. Yes, folks, over the course of this show, in order to bolster my eventual class, to being the 37th Beatle, I will enumerate some of the varyingly tenuous connections to the Beatles that I have. The first is this. Like John Lennon and George Harrison, I too went to Dovedale County Primary School. There'll be more of those. So... (laughs) So there you go. John, Paul, George are in place. And at number four we have... Well done. There's usually some smart aleck who shouts Pete Best, but you're quite right. (laughs) 
Chronologically, yes, it should be Pete Best, but no, I'm sorry for the purposes of my list. Number four is indeed Ringo. The Beatles, perfectly serviceable rock and roll band with Pete Best on the drums. But when Ringo joins, that's the last piece of the puzzle, right? See, the Beatles influenced rock and pop genres and forms that didn't exist at the time and wouldn't even be recognized for decades to come. When Ringo joins, for better or worse, is the moment the Beatles invent the boy band. <laughs> all, all your classic boy band archetypes are now in place. You have your sarcastic, loudmouth bad boy. You have your dreamy-eyed romantic. You have the slightly cool and detached one. And once Ringo's in, you've got the just plain adorable little one who all the mums want to take home and make dinner for. <laughs> Ringo invented Mark Owen, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> But if Ringo's in at number four, then, yeah, number five, it really should be Pete. Pete Best is the fifth Beatle. That's that question settled. We will hear no more about it, OK? And if Pete is number five, then number six really has to be Stu. Stuart Sutcliffe, original bass player. Very promising young artist. Lennon's best mate when they were at art college. And uh, famously, he goes out to Hamburg with the Beatles and then falls in with the artsy-fartsy avant-garde crowd in Hamburg. He uh, falls in love with a photographer called Astrid Kircher. And eventually, Stuart thinks, I never wanted to be in a rock and roll band. I'm going to stay in Hamburg, marry Astrid, paint paintings and live happily ever after and drops dead of a brain hemorrhage at the age of 22. <laughs> First little tragic footnote in Beatles history. You can uh, actually get a pretty good overview of this whole period if you uh, watch the 1994 film Backbeat, uh, which I do recommend, but it distinguishes itself from every other film made about the Beatles in that it's a good film. <laughs> uh, there have been an awful lot of films made about the Beatles and, moreover, a lot of awful films made about the Beatles. I could go on at great length about my problems with Beatles biopics, but we are kind of against the clock, so it's better to condense them into a single I Am The Walrus parody. <laughs> Telling it the way it was, or at least the way that everybody thinks. John's a tortured soul or just a nut Who's in love with his mummy Nobody can do scouse accents Everybody talks like brummies Beatles biopics They're a genre of their own With one or two exceptions Best left alone Beatles biopics They keep on churning out somehow Is there anyone who gives a toss Who doesn't know about What accent this is supposed to be? And you can see from the eyebrows, aren't you? I'm dead local and cheeky. While we are still nominally in Hamburg, we should put the late Tony Sheridan in there at number seven, shouldn't we? And uh, at eight to 12, let's put in the rest of the original Quarrymen. They were never Beatles themselves, but they were in the band that would ultimately become the Beatles. They were proto-Beatles, if you will. And at uh, 13 and 14, I think I'm going to put in a couple of spare drummers. And it is actually Andy White playing the drums on the seven-inch version of Love Me Do. So in goes Andy White at number 13. And... A couple of years later, first Australian tour, poor old Ringo was too ill to travel, so they just left him behind and took a bloke called Jimmy Nickel instead. Um, so in goes Jimmy Nickel at number 14. It is rather the lot of drummers that even the famous ones are treated as interchangeable in a way other band members just aren't. <laughs> I I'm fairly certain that if it had been John or Paul who was ill, they wouldn't have just quietly switched him with Jerry Marsden and nobody noticed. <laughs> But, but, if it is any consolation to Ringo, he does form the basis of the second of today's... Mitch Ben's tenuous Beatles connections. Unlike John, George and myself, Ringo did not go to Dovedale. He went to a different school called St Silas, as did my mum. Ringo took a bit of a shine to my mum when they were about eight. He used to follow her around the playground at break. At one point, he gave her a curtain ring in a box as a token of his affections. In fact, my mum is mentioned in the first book written about the Beatles, Hunter Davis's The Beatles, 1968, in which he interviews Mary Maguire, Ringo's childhood babysitter, who said once he brought his girl friend home and his sister, she was called Gelatine. My mum's name is Geraldine. I did actually contemplate Ringo was nearly my dad as the title for this, but uh, <laughs> that does stretch things both logically and biologically, doesn't it? <laughs> I 
Alrighty, couple more people who played with the Beatles, but were never actually Beatles themselves. Now, for my money, the best instrumental break on any Beatles track is the keyboard solo on Get Back. Amazing. And played by the great Billy Preston, so in goes Billy at number 15. And at 16, uh, on the White Album, George writes, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, maybe the best song ever written about playing your guitar, but weirdly, when the solo starts, it's not George, it's Eric Clapton. I'm sure Eric was very grateful for the gig and immediately expressed his gratitude by running off with George's wife. <laughs> Something in the way she moves Out of me house and in with Eric. So... So at number 17, we're going to put in their manager, Brian Epstein, who was often referred to as the fifth Beatle at the time, maybe with more justification than anybody else on the list. And, of course, at number 18, we put in their producer, George Martin. Now, what you have with the Beatles is unbelievable raw talent placed in the hands of guys who actually nurture and develop it rather than just milk it for a few bucks and move on to the next hot young thing. This almost never happens in the pop business. Brian Epstein... Never wanted to be a rock and roll manager at all. He was a respectable middle-class Jewish kid, family-owned a furniture store. He wanted to do something a bit groovier, so Brian opens a record store. Now, in 1962, all the kids are coming into Brian's store saying, have the Beatles made any records yet, Brian? Have the Beatles made any records yet? Who are the Beatles, asks Brian of the girls on the tell. That's that band everybody goes to see at lunchtime that the kids are all mad about, they reply. Righto, thinks Brian, goes down to the cavern, sees the Beatles, and, depending on who you talk to, either thinks... Yes, I have beheld the future of rock and roll, and I will be a part of it, or just falls hopelessly in love with John. (laughs) Because Epi was gay, and they locked you up for being gay in 62, because everybody knows the best way to stop men having sex with each other is put them in prison. (laughs) You couldn't be both kinds of out in 62. Meanwhile, George Martin, similarly... Not your typical rock and roll producer, because, again, not really a rock and roll producer at all. Now, when this demo tape the Beatles had made for Decca gets to EMI, it gets farmed out to Parlophone. It's where all the Goons singles came out, all the Peter Sellers records have come out, all of which have been produced by George Martin. So when George Martin gets given the Beatles, he actually wants to hear what they've got. And, of course, what they've got is, please, please me, she loves you, and I want to hold your hand, and then the world has changed forever. Right, best press on. We want here 19, 20, 21, do them fairly rapid order. Little Scouse Mafia who kind of surrounded the Beatles in the 60s. Number 19, Derek Taylor, their press office, often referred to as the fifth Beatle by reporters at the time because he's the one they actually got to talk to. Number 20, Mal Evans started as the roadie, became a kind of studio helper. Uh, 21, Neil Aspinall, sort of general fixer. Like I say, this is a sort of Scouse Mafia that surrounded the Beatles during the 60s, maybe for kind of security blanket purposes because the Beatles' relationship with Liverpool is a bit weird because I grew up in Liverpool in the 70s. January 1970, I was born. I missed being Scouse in the 60s by three weeks. <laughs> and as I remember, and as is still very much the case, Liverpudlians, while incredibly proud of the Beatles and, like, why wouldn't they be? Not sure how happy they are about just how much Liverpool is doomed to dine out on the Beatles thing for the rest of time. And this kicks off occasionally. He did a few years ago. Uh, it was 2008 when Liverpool was the European capital of culture, you may remember, um, they had a big opening ceremony in front of St George's Hall, and Ringo turned up. And at some point, this journalist asked him, so, uh, Ringo, what do you miss about Liverpool? And Ringo, being an honest sort, said, eh, well, nothing really, which is almost certainly <laughs> true. I think you've got to remember Matt Ringo. He was the only really working-class one in the band. The others were from the leafy suburbs, much like myself. Ringo was from the Dingle. And Ringo now lives in a house in Los Angeles roughly twice the size of the Dingle. (laughs) I don't think Ringo misses Liverpool at all. (laughs) But, you know, Scousers can be a bit chippy about this sort of thing, and vengeance was exacted in due course, albeit slightly surreal Scouse vengeance. It's stored in Liverpool for all the world to see. A statue of the Beatles rendered in Tokyo. An ornamental hedge in the shape of the Fab Four. But it's not looking very Fab no more. Cos somebody decapitated Ringo. Somebody comes off the drummer's head. Somebody decapitated Ringo. Cos there's something that the silly bugger said. Somebody decapitated Ringo. The Topia is ruined now because Somebody decapitated Ringo Now Ringo's even shorter than he was (laughs) 
true story. Well, I think that just about does it for contemporaries of the Beatles. We'll start another column now, shall we, for... Uh, the new Beatles, if you will. Uh, artists who came along in the Beatles' wake and have in some way pretended to or perhaps been offered the crown of succession as the new Beatles. And obviously, the first and most obvious people to put on the list are not bloody Oasis! Oasis are not getting on my list! <laughs> Oasis spent 15 years droning on about the Beatles without at any point showing any understanding of why the Beatles were good. <laughs> Because the whole point of the Beatles is you didn't know what they were going to do next. You didn't know they were going to come back with Eleanor Rigby, Yellow Submarine, or Helter Bloody Skelter. Was there ever a moment in the 15 years of Oasis's career when you didn't know what they were going to do next? <laughs> There's probably also a bit of a tribal element at play here, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, it probably didn't sit very well with Scousers that it was a Mancunian band laying claim to the whole Beatles thing. <laughs> But why would you want to be the new Beatles? What band could withstand the pressure of expectation of being the new Beatles? It would tear them apart. And we know this because there was a new Beatles and it did tear them apart. I'm going to put them in as numbers 22 to 25 because there was four of them. Band from the very early 1970s called anybody? Badfinger. Scouse stroke Welsh band, who were pretty much the Beatles' anointed successors. They were the closest thing there ever was to an official new Beatles. Paul wrote and produced their debut single, Come and Get It. They were led by two singer-songwriters, Pete Ham and Tom Evans, who looked like John and Paul. They were, all the signs were there. So they were basically hailed as the new Beatles, and it did. It completely destroyed them. Their only lasting legacy is, is that, weirdly, is that song, Without You. You know, I can't live! Like that one that Harry Nielsen had the massive hit with and then Mariah Carey weaponized that thing. That's it. <laughs> they, they wrote that. That was one of theirs. So, so you, don't, you don't want to be the new Beatles. Nobody wants to be the new Beatles. All right, except Jeff Lynne. He really wants to be the new Beatles. <laughs> Jeff Lynne has always wanted to be the Beatles. Oh, Jeff Lynne wants to be a Beatles so bad. I mean, let's be honest. In ELO in the 70s and 80s, Jeff Lynne was just making the records he wished the Beatles still were. That's what that band was, wasn't it? Oh, I miss the Beatles so much. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll make their records for them until they come back. <laughs> I'm going to nominate my own new Beatles now. And it's a bit contentious, but it's my show, so nah. I'm uh, going to put them in as 27 to 32, because there's six of them. I think the real new Beatles was Monty Python. I do. I think the Pythons inherited the Beatles thing more than any band I can think of. And there's all kinds of Beatles connections. Obviously, George produced a lot of the Python movies. And there's, an, there's a definite Lennon and McCartney parallel to be drawn with Cleese and Palin, isn't there? Do you think? On the one hand, you've got this borderline sociopath who's at great pains to point out that he doesn't give a damn what anybody thinks about him and, like all such people, lies awake all night wondering what people think about him. <laughs> and then you have the ostensibly happy-go-lucky, hey, guys, why can't we all just get along one, who you sense has a core of steel and takes precisely no crap from anybody. So. <laughs> but if you're going to put the Pythons in the list, then really, next at number 33, you've got to have the point at which the Pythons and the Beatles intersect, which they very much do in the person of good old Neil Innes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, musical genius and the Bonzo Dog Doodah band, a uh, sort of late 60s comedy band. They're in Magical Mystery Tour. They're that weird band who turn up in the strip joint near the end. So Neil's actually in a Beatles movie. And then in the 70s, Neil writes a lot of the music and songs for the Python movies. And then at the end of the 70s, Neil and Eric Idle at the Pythons collaborate on The Ruttles, which is this feature length spoof Beatles documentary movie, which, in fact, you know what? Forget Backbeat. That's the best film ever made about the Beatles. <laughs> it really is. Alrighty, quick mention now to a couple of people who, while not mm, directly connected to the Beatles, probably did more to keep the Beatles' flame burning over the years than pretty much anybody else I can think of. Number 34, going to put in Dave Catlin Birch. And number 35, I'm going to put in Neil Harrison. Now, Dave Catlin Birch is bootleg Paul. <laughs> and Neil Harrison is bootleg John. <laughs> now, the bootleg Beatles have now been the Beatles for four times as long as the Beatles were the Beatles. <laughs> I think that deserves some kind of recognition, I really do. You will notice we are now getting perilously close to that magic number 37, which I rather arbitrarily assigned myself. In fact, only room for one more person before we get there. What about Neil Finn at a crowded house? Wants to be a Beatle so bad he sings in a Scouse accent despite being from New Zealand. Um, <laughs> somebody in Edinburgh shouted, what about Yoko? Yeah, not sure about that. That's right. uh, Yoko is kind of considered the anti beetle by a lot of people, isn't she? <laughs> Like, if I put Yoko's name on the list, all the other names just disappear. 
<laughs> Tell you what I'm putting in at number 36. Elvis Costello. I don't know. Yeah, probably the best rock singer-songwriter Britain's produced since the Beatles. And, of course, right at the end of the 80s, he had a brief songwriting partnership with Paul McCartney, which I kind of wish they'd kept up, actually. I think it brought Elvis out of himself a bit melodically. And we all know Paul's a much better songwriter when there's a sarcastic bastard in the room. Uh, <laughs> it's the only thing keeping him away from the frog chorus, let's face it. <laughs> But look, here we are, number 37 already. Do I really dare put me in a number that... On what grounds? On what grounds? Perhaps I have one last. Mitch Ben's tenuous Beatles connections. Yes, I do, folks, and it's a good one, so strap in. I met my wife, Clara, while we were both living in Edinburgh in 1995, and she enticed me back to her place with the line, Would you like to come and see my snake? Specifically a Californian king snake by the name of Oscar. Now, about a year later, we decided we were going to move down to London together. So my dad rented a transit van in Liverpool, drove it all the way up to Edinburgh in order to load everything we owned onto it, and then we were going to drive it all the way back down to London and unload everything into this flat we were going to start renting. Now, the way you transport snakes is in a bag. Seriously, just make sure he's had something to eat in the last couple of days and tie him into a bag and put him somewhere safe. I'm not kidding, this is how it's done. So Clara tied Oscar into a sort of cloth pyjama bag and stuck him in the van's glove compartment to keep him out of harm's way. (laughs) Now, just as we're putting the last items in, Clara checks up on Oscar's progress. Oscar has managed to undo the knot in the bag. (laughs) There is a gap at the back of the glove box. He has slithered off to we know not where, all right? So, oh, no, in a panic, we slam all the van doors and we think, right, if he's still in there somewhere... We're just going to have to find him in London. There is not time to check everything now. And if he's managed to get out of the van, then that's it. We've lost him. We will never see him again. So we drive all the way down to London, waiting to find a snake halfway down the motorway. It doesn't happen. We get to this flat. We take every box out of the van. No snake. Open up every box. No snake. Shake out every boot or similar receptacle. No snake. Unscrew the wooden panels off the walls of the van and look down the back of them. No snake. And we thought, oh no, we must have got out of the van in Edinburgh. And, and, and that's it. We've lost him. We were genuinely quite heartbroken. This snake had brought us together in a weird way and we'd managed to lose him. Now, about six weeks later, we're sitting in this flat. Phone rings. And it's Clara's younger sister. Are you guys watching Animal Hospital? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you might want to watch Animal Hospital because um, Pete Best, formerly of the Beatles, just found a snake in a van he rented in Liverpool. <laughs> The mid-90s, the anthology albums just came out, so Pete put a band together, and they were actually loading their gear into Dingwalls in Camden. And it was the bass player who saw him first, lumped this big bass amp up onto the stage, looked into the back of it, ah, they used to throw all these cables into the back of my amp. (laughs) Reaches inside, takes the cables out, the cables look at him. (laughs) He passes a very understandable brick. Um... (laughs) They call the coppers, the coppers turn up and they're like, Neff off, mate, we're not bloody touching it. So the coppers call the RSPCA, who turn up, put Oscar in a bag, told you, and, <laughs> and cart him off to this bird and reptile sanctuary in Kent. So a couple of weeks later, Clara actually had to go on Animal Hospital and do the whole tearful reunion bit with Oscar the Snake. So uh, <laughs> Pete Best found my snake, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> really make me the 37th Beatle? Or should number 37 and all the numbers thereafter just go to anybody who's trying to do anything a bit interesting or a bit creative? Because the Beatles do cast such an incredibly long shadow over everything that it really is almost impossible to live up to their legacy. But that's no reason not to try. You kind of came in through the pores of your skin when you were my kind of age Growing up in the pool, and home and in school, at every stage. Having to listen to how closely it missed all the good old days. And looking around, seeing it tumbling down in the worst kind of ways. When you were my kind of age. So Brit Pop coming a mile off All my 70s baby friends Kicking themselves for missing the 60s So they did the 60s again Bought the clothes, they got the haircuts Fashioned themselves into clothes Union jacks upon their jackets And their vintage Epiphones But it couldn't last Cos it 
Plastic pop stars on their telly singing plastic hits Falling out of plastic limos flashing plastic bits Plastic hips to striking poses on the plastic scene Plastic faces smiling out of plastic magazines Oh, hang on Gonna come in through the back door Take us by surprise Coming in under the radar Pop up before you rise Somewhere in their back bedroom Or on the internet The future of music's waiting We haven't heard them yet And it won't be on television Won't be on ITV The voice isn't gonna find them And no will be GT Nothing unexpected ever came out of those How will they make it happen? They'll think something, I suppose This is the point, folks If a bunch of chances from Liverpool With no musical training And no access to any advanced technology Can take the simplest art form ever conceived Rock and roll, three chords and a beat And fashion timeless masterpieces out of it then there is no excuse for the rest of us, and there's no limit to what we might be able to achieve. And if there's a point I've tried to make Some nugget of truth for you to take Remember the past that we all love so but the future is where we're gonna go Thank you very much, that's the end of the show And I hope it was alright <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the end of the show. Please enjoy the rest of your night. I did 37 meals in half an hour and I squeezed them in somehow. If it wasn't quite your kind of thing, never mind, it's the Archers now. Oh, yeah, it's time for the Archers now. That was Mitch Benn as the 37th Beatle. It was written by and starred me, Mitch Benn, and it was produced by Alexandra Smith. That was the Comedy of the Week from BBC Radio 4. You can hear more comedy at 11.30, 6.30 and 11pm every weekday on Radio 4 or any time you like through the BBC iPlayer. For more information, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Ha, 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 ha.